This podcast is brought to you by LMU Munich. Hi everyone, I'm Mahmoud. Uh, it's true, I used to work at PayPal. Uh, it was a really good time. But uh, here today, I'm going to talk to you about URLs. Guys, I love URLs. This is very strange, I know, but it's PyCon Web, and it wouldn't be the web without links and URLs. I think that they are the most advanced technology to ever reach the masses, ever, right? Even before we are able to drive and so forth, we're writing letters. Kids are writing letters to Santa asking for, you know, things on Amazon.com in this case. And as you know, uh, <laughs> this beautiful, beautiful letter to Santa is probably received by some dad. Right? And that dad has to go out and buy this RC car. That's actually what this is. So this child has just harnessed the power of the web in the shape of the URL written in crayon. Now, realistically though, where can we find the URLs? We see them in the front end, your browser, w3.org, talking about W3 naming schemes. That was what they were called before they were URLs. You find them in the back end in your routing. Right? With more path, a uh, nice uh, Python web framework. This one actually is classic, it's mine. But you also find them in the non-web, right? They extend beyond the web, right? You're going to clone a library that I wrote, use git clone. That's not a web protocol, but it's using a URL. In fact, URLs leak everywhere outside the web. You'll see them on billboards, on buses, and even in the logo of your favorite web company, Mozilla. I actually really like this logo. It's probably because I love URLs. But it's a really nice logo. I think you'll agree. In fact, uh, there's this famous uh, hacker. His name is Kevin Polson. And uh, basically, he was really, really good. He hacked like the Department of Defense with a calculator. Eventually, they caught him. Uh, <laughs> and the day he got out of prison, he uh, like remarked, right? He's like, one thing I never expected, one thing I can't even believe my eyes, is you see these cryptic letters up on billboards. Anyways, now he works for the New York Times. I'm sure he sees a lot of URLs in his business. So what is a URL? Well, according to UrbanDictionary.com, it is some long-ass link you're somehow supposed to fit into the address bar, uh, as defined a little bit earlier this year. Uh, UrbanDictionary.com, of course, another good URL to visit. But no, really, what is a URL? So, a URL is uniform, that's what the U stands for. It means that the mechanism stays the same even if the type of the resource differs. So if you're getting HTML or CSS or JavaScript or some other long ass link, it's uniform. Everything can understand it. It points to a resource. Now a resource, what is that? It's basically the most general term that they could find at the time. It's, it could be anything, even dynamic content, something that's changing as long as it represents a consistent concept. The example they give is like the weather. You go to the weather report, the page is always changing. It's a resource though, it's the weather report. It's not a particular snapshot in time of that weather. And finally, it's a locator. Now, maybe somebody was asking about this before the talk and they were saying, what's the difference between a URI and a URL? Has anyone heard that, that question? Yeah, I see some hands. So, an identifier says that something has an identity. A locator goes a little bit further than that. It says, here's how to find it on the network. So basically, URLs are like a treasure map that every browser and program can you know, understand and navigate. Uniform resource locators. Now, the history of the URL is very, very long. I'm speaking far too slowly right now, so we're going to have to speed it up because we're going to go through every single one of these RFCs in detail from 1992 to 2008 <laughs> to 2014. Uh, we're going to cover each one of these in uh, 20 minutes. So, no, really, uh, basically, <laughs> we're not going to do that. Uh, <laughs> but the history is long.com. Uh, it started out as W3 hypertext names. Um, then uh, we sort of like fast forward about uh, 13 years and finally we're at this one that I call the gold standard, RFC 3986. Uh, and then today you'll find a living document uh, updated by the Web Hypertext Application Working Group uh, that is a bunch of browsers that get together and they try to like, you know, make a standard out of what browsers do. But realistically, just to nip this one in the bud, 2005, 
That's like sort of the canonical URL. And we'll be focusing on that one. We won't go through every single one. But if you took every single one and you just did a word count, it's 67,000 words. Um, you know, we don't have time to read that right now. But, uh, and, and this is just for the RFCs that explicitly talk about URLs. What we'll see as well is that a lot of URLs are defined in other RFCs here and there. It wasn't really a single concrete concept starting out. In fact, it was very overambitious. When it started, the U standard for universal. It stood for universal, right? And it was very ambitious. They wanted a, UR, a URI for every book. They wanted a URI for every telephone number. They wanted it to go into every aspect of life. Very ambitious. And uh, they created so many terms that this led to some confusion. And the W3C had to admit that it was a little bit overambitious with this whole URI, URL, et cetera. So they issued a statement. But we're going to focus instead on what a URL really is, which is something that's simple, is something that's transcribable, meaning that I can write it down, like that kid did to Santa. I can write it down. And there should be no barrier to entry. You can do it right now. You can take a pen, a nice plone pen, write it on the person next to you's hand. Or you can get in touch. The point is, it should be usable by humans and computers, right? This is our interface to the web. So we're going to learn the right amount of URL stuff, right? We're not going to go through every single RFC. We're going to focus on this simple URL here. Really easy, guys. Come on. Do you need more than this? <laughs> uh, no, a URL is actually something very complex, something that we often take for granted. Because we use it every day, we assume that as engineers, we just know how they work. But no, as engineers, we have to delve a little bit deeper, learn the real anatomy. Uh, so what surprises people is that there are so many parts to a URL. And like, here's the scheme, the user info, the host, the port, the query string, the fragment, the path. Each of these has slightly different encoding characteristics, slightly different uh, semantics. But I assure you, it's something that we can cover in the next 20 minutes. OK. So we're going to start at the top. We're going to start at the scheme. Here's my little breadcrumbs here. You can see we're doing HTTPS. So the important thing about the scheme is that it's short, it's case insensitive. It's just letters, numbers, plus, minus, and dot. And these are explicitly registered with the IANA, says the International Association for Numbers and Addresses or something like that. They get to register all the port numbers and all that fun stuff. But the scheme. It determines all of the following semantics for that URL. So d different URLs are going to act differently, as we'll see. Right here, HTTPS is probably one that we're very familiar with. And we kind of feel like we know how it works. But we also have SSH, rsync, gopher, mail to, tell, and about 60 others that I found in common use. They're probably they're like way more than that, technically. But in common use, these are the ones that I found. Next, we move on to the user info. This comes after the scheme. Oh, wait. No, there's actually something we skipped. It's the netlock slashes. You thought this was going to be easy. No. Even these two little slashes that we totally take for granted is a point of contention. So look at this URL, mail to my real email. You can send me an email right now if you want. Uh, but I'd prefer if you paid attention. Uh, so you know, you notice this doesn't have any slashes. But this is a real scheme. And this is a real like, you know, URL. And here we have like, you know, blog that I write. And this one has slashes. What's up with that? You've seen this. You probably haven't thought of it. These slashes are just magic. Disappearing magic. And uh, no, actually what it turns out is that if something uses a network location, if it uses a host, a port, something like that, it's going to get these slashes. But whether or not it does that is completely up to the scheme. So if you gave me some magic scheme that we just made up today, and you didn't tell me anything else about that URL, I couldn't tell you if those slashes go there or not. It's totally up to you, and it's up to what gets registered. All right. You know, that's a point of complexity that I had no idea about when I got into this. But I think now we're safe to move on to the user info. So username, colon, password, at sign. The password is then base64 encoded and often stuck into an authentication header in HTTP, if you're used to HTTP. Uh, this is called HTTP basic auth. It's basically also deprecated. There are better ways to do this stuff in most cases. 
Uh, however, what does make this interesting is that this is our first percent encoded field, or two fields, depending on if you want to count username and password separately. So percent encoding, you guys are all familiar with this, right? Percent sign 20, percent sign 20, percent sign, all that fun stuff. So what's the deal with that? So the percent encoding, aka quoting, is there to support non-ASCII data in URLs, and also special characters in URLs, of which there are many special characters. But uh, the point is that the byte value of whatever that character is is replaced with percent sign XX, where X is the hex, like, you know, for that byte. Uh, don't have time to go over hex stuff with you right now. But there's, what's interesting about this is that there's no standard encoding underneath. Right? Whether or not that stuff is UTF-8 encoded, or Latin-1, or just straight up binary, the URL has no way of indicating that to you. And that percent encoding can be different in the query stream, and the path, and the username. It could all use different encodings underneath those, ask, those percent values. It's kind of a mess. It's kind of a mess. But thankfully, we have the UTF-8 convention right now. And so you know, if you want to use binary, you can. But I really just say, probably encode your stuff to UTF-8 before you shove into a URL. Here's actually, a, I don't know if you can make it out, but here's a, a classifieds ad for a job. Some of you looking for work. I, I, I don't know if you want this one, where they uh, pasted a whole thing with uh, just that's all percent encoding. It would probably take you an hour to transcribe, and you'd probably get it wrong. Uh, it's you know, no surprise, it's a government job. They do everything enterprise, so you know, it's got lots of percent signs. You know it's good. All right. Now we get on to the host, PyConWeb.com in our example, uh, or you know, Kim.com. If you want to change your name to be a valid host in the URL, you can also just make your name Kim.com. I figured he'd be famous here. Anyways, uh, but no, really, a host is IPv4, IPv6 in brackets, or a string that gets resolved with DNS. Everyone here know what DNS is? OK. So what's interesting about DNS is that it basically just supports ASCII. It might even support less than that. I don't know. But what, the way it supports Unicode is very interesting. It's called punicoding. It's a different kind of encoding. It's not like percent encoding. It has a way better name. I think you'll agree. And uh, here's an example of how this is done. So we have a Unicode host name. Butcher.ch? It's, it's Swiss. I'm allowed to butcher the pronunciation. Um, and so uh, <laughs> this, becomes, uh, this becomes this over here. This is our ASCII that will get sent to DNS. Now, this is really interesting. It starts with an XN dash dash. That's how you know that it's going to be puny coded. And then this continues on uh, to be BCHER. That looks familiar. That looks a lot like this but with the e removed. <laughs> and so, uh, but then there's this dash KVA after it, right? That was never there in the first place. So what's happened here is that they've removed the one Unicode character and they've put it over at the end in a binary encoding that we aren't going to go over now with the index of where that belongs. So on the other side, they can reassemble it back into Butcher. You thought URLs were simple. All right. Now, this also can be used in the TLD. Here we're using .ch, but here, like, you know, I think this is Arabic or something like that. I'll leave it as an exercise to what this URL actually is. I've forgotten since I wrote this slide. But um, the one reason why this is here is because I'm going to point out that it takes these dots. The dots are significant. It does individual segments for the dots. So, uh, you know, it doesn't just do one XNN at the beginning and merge everything else. And this is what it looks like when there are no ASCII compatible characters in the URL. It's just all after the XN dash dash. Whew, right? OK. We'll do something easy now. The port, right? There's no surprises here. Positive integers only, no negative 1 or negative 2 or negative a million, negative i, I don't know. Uh, also registered with IANA. Um, and it's not emitted if equal to the scheme default. So the interesting thing about this that I learned is that uh, basically every um, scheme, when you register it, you're supposed to also register the default port for that scheme. And then if the URL is using that default port, you don't output it there. Now, maybe you notice that in our example here, I'm doing something weird. I'm doing HTTPS with a colon 8080. That's pretty non-standard, but I just had to do that in order to make the port be emitted. If I was doing 443, port wouldn't be there. All right, easy. And we're almost done now. 
Okay, the path. Now this is, uh, this is what I call, and I think is commonly known as like the host local hierarchy. So we've made it on our way to like the remote host. We're now on this other network like host. And we want to navigate down some path. And this literally derives just from Unix, don't, like Unix paths. You know, it has the forward slashes and everything. Uh, and it, you know, the order is obviously important. You know, here we're looking at the anatomy and we're on the scheme, even though it should say path, whoops. Okay, um, it's also percent encoded. You've probably seen those. Uh, absolute versus relative is pretty interesting though. Uh, it's not that, you don't need to laugh. It's not that, uh, <laughs> that like interesting. But what's interesting about this is that if you omit uh, information in the URL, you basically always end up with a relative path. What do I mean by this? I mean like this right here, mail to Mahmoud at hatnote.com. This was surprising to me. I thought Mahmoud would be the user at a host. But no, this is actually all just the path. This is a relative path. There's no host, there's nothing like that. That's why there's no slashes, right? Interestingly also, this right here, this pipe is not pipe uh, URL. This is also a URL, actually, despite the pipes. Uh, <laughs> this is a URL, and it's a relative path. It's a complete URL, totally valid, uh, because every path, and almost any string, uh, is itself a URL, thanks to this whole relative path nonsense. Uh, it made it really hard to write a val there's like, it's very hard to validate URLs as a result of this uh, sort of shortcut. All right, the query string. This is my favorite part. I know you're all excited for it. It has the question mark, gets really exciting. Equal signs, ampersands, all the best punctuation lives in the query string. Uh, so yeah, lang equals en, rfc equals 3986. Order of the query string is preserved and is important for some, uh, for some applications. Also, duplicate keys combine. Now, I'm not sure if you're familiar with this data structure, but this makes this an ordered multi-dict. Probably the most powerful Python data structure I use day to day. Uh, basically, it's a mapping, and uh, you can have multiple keys, multiple values. It's invertible, and you won't lose any information when doing so. Happy to go into detail about that if you have questions. Finally, we get to the fragment. This is the front-end developer's favorite part. Uh, you know, you can put anything you want after there. We're all done with the special characters and stuff. There's no real fancy stuff that happens here. And so JavaScript devs can just go nuts and put whatever they want in there because this part isn't sent to the server in HTTP. Now, other protocols can use it for what they want, but it's typically not sent to the server. Interestingly, uh, Tim Berners-Lee, creator of the URL and the HTTP and all that stuff, says this is, they decided on this uh, pound sign 42 because it's based on apartment numbers, you know? Like you go to a particular address and the sub address within that usually has a number 42 or whatever. So let's really unleash this. Look at a Pythonic example. Now Python's pretty powerful. Here's a bit of code that you could probably all understand. We define a function, takes a couple of positional arguments, has a keyword argument. We'll put it in a file called core.py. Take another file, call it caller.py. We import that function over here. Put a nice comment in there. Powerful. Right? And we're going to call that function. Now this is pretty powerful. Python's import semantics and function call semantics are pretty powerful, right? Now this is a very strange example, but I'm here to tell you that URLs can keep up. Everything that we just described there can be encoded into a URL scheme that I created just for you guys. So we have a pi scheme with an authority that goes function module package because we go from most specific to least specific with the host. Then we use the positional arguments. We're going to throw those in the path. And then we're going to put a nice question mark in there, put our keyword arguments in there, and finally leave with a comment, awesome. Now, I'm going to go ahead and get off the slide real quick before somebody tries to do this in production for some reason. But URLs are powerful is the point. Let's get back to reality, though. So now real Python URLs, how are these used? We have the URL par parse module that's in the standard library. But no standard library is perfect, especially not one that was written at the same time that URLs were becoming solidified, right? So it's mostly RFC 1738 from 1994 and RFC 2396, 1998. If you read it, it says itself it's not 3986 compatible. It's not even of this millennium. URLs are just tuples of strings. 
it's going to be just a matter of time until we have an escaping issue there. You can't escape from an escaping issue when you're treating a URL as just strings. It also has uh, hard-coded schemes. So the semantics of the URLs that it understands is limited, and there's no way to extend that. It has crafty APIs. So if you look at the docs, you'll see there's a URL parse versus URL split. I'll give a free MicroPython to anyone that can tell me the difference of them when questions roll around. Like, I bet you off the top of your head you can't. So what do we do? Well, what I did was I went and made a package called Hyperlink that you can do pip install Hyperlink right now, and you can get a pretty nice library. Uh, it's RFC 3986 plus compatible. It's a, it has a full-fledged URL type. We're going to do object-oriented now. It's got 58 schemes and counting, painstakingly collected with the default ports and everything. Probably the most complete collection in the Python world. Uh, it's also got a lot of smart conventions built right in. It has plus schemes. If you've ever seen git plus SSH, that sort of thing, it understands that natively. It has good IPv6 validation cross-platform. and also does normalization for when you want to smush all those paths down and so forth. It's 2.6 two six to 3.6 tested. It's on GitHub. It has full docs. Now let's highlight some of the API things. The URL type that it has is immutable. So you can throw it in a dictionary. You can do other things with it without rendering it to a actual string. I think that's pretty cool. Um, it also makes a clear distinction between the two main types of URLs that it sort of crudely like turns into these two different APIs. URIs are for computers. IRIs are for humans. U stands for uniform. I stands for internationalized. Internationalized, as you can expect, has clear Unicode support. It's not going to do puny code rendering. That's not easy to read. Everything is going to be easy to read when you use IRIs. What does that look like? You do a URL. You take it from text. This is real running code from the docs. You take example.com. It's got percent encoding hiding in here. Plus, like, it's mixed with some Unicode over here. So we turn it into an IRI and look at the text of that. Oh, look, it's all nicely sort of uh, written out. Cafe lay, that's French. Coffee, milk, or something. OK. And then here, if we turn it to a URI and look at the text of that, it's all percent encoded. So it makes a clear distinction between what's for computers and what's for humans. You know, what's for display versus what's for network transmission. Has a lot of tests. If you want corner cases, you can go read my tests. We're always looking for more. You can PR some corner cases and we'll test them. My favorite one is like Magnet. Magnet's probably one of my favorite schemes because it uses the query string a lot. <laughs> uh, that's a legal torrent. So what's the history of hyperlink? My idea of fun is very messed up, I realized, making this slide. In 2013, I'm like, let me make a Sans.io HTTP library. And then I spent all my time reading those 67,000 words of URL RFCs. Then in 2017, I came back to it because I sort of got stuck reading RFCs. And I decided to make my URL, which I released as boltons.urlutils, and combine it with twisted.python.url, which needed to be updated. And that became hyperlink. And now the hyper project, appropriately named, uh, is uh, sort of going to take that in. I'm going to work with it there. And uh, we're going to develop nice Sans.io web libraries. If you haven't heard about Sans.io, I recommend looking that up. So in short, URLs are flexible, powerful, becoming ever more useful. And most importantly, they are what you make them. So go forth, make more schemes, find more applications. You see the power here, right? And you see that there are good libraries for working with them too. So by all means, uh, you know, carry on. Thank you so much, um, Hashemi. Nice work here. Now we have room for a number of questions, so we just take the first one. Right. Uh, is there any use case for metal paper slashes aside from um, specifying protocol relative paths? No, that's a great point, actually. So, um, like Tim Berners Lee said that he regrets putting those slashes in there, but we, we as a community have adopted them. Like I said, URLs, what you make them. And Chrome. Uh, will now interpret like a, a schemeless protocol with two slashes to basically, you know, be HTTP if you're on an HTTP site or HTTPS if you're on an H HTTPS site. So it's a scheme relative path. That's a great point. Okay, all right. Uh, so, all right, please. Uh, could you please go back to the slide with the URL parse versus URL split? 
Yes. And we have some questions about this. So. Make it a quick one. <laughs> How far so, back? So what the deal with the like difference? Oh, what is the actual difference? Yes, yeah, so I know the difference. Like it means the problems are going to one of the RFCs, but you said something. Right, so, so there's a sort of a crafty thing here. When URLs were still coming out, they didn't know if we maybe needed like sort of path oriented with a, with a semicolon or colon or something like this. They didn't know if that was actually going to like sort of take like hold and become a standard as part of the URL. So they built it in, but nobody really uses those. And you probably don't want to start using them. It's 2017 and URL is pretty like, you know, stable at this point. So here we are though at the standard library and you have this URL parse URL split split. And it's kind of confusing still. Hyperlink doesn't suffer from those issues. Great question. Yeah, we have room for more questions. OK. Um, asking from a security perspective, yes. uh, the Python URL pass module is kind of annoying. Uh, how does hyperlink pass, a hyperlink pass URLs? Does it pass them like a browser does, or does it follow the RFC completely? Because browsers have different interpretation of white spaces at the beginning. That, that, that's right. So uh, the question is, uh, does hyperlink parse URLs like browsers? That's a, that's a really tough moving target. So if you go read the Wetwaga, like the working group uh, specification for the parser, it's constantly changing. They call it a living document. They're just chasing after the browser vendors as fast as they can trying to update it. And if you read that parser spec, it's also in plain English, which is a really poor API for writing a parser. 3986, on the other hand, has a nice regex that it defines, and you get really nice properties from parsing a URL as a regex first. So um, it doesn't quite parse like a browser does, but it does have APIs like .click, which allows you to navigate as a browser would if you were to click on a particular uh, like relative link or something like that. Great question. Uh, one question Another question. Yeah. So uh, what the output format of the parsing by hyperlink? Because for URL parse, we used to have a lot of like constants with the indexes for coded inside. Right. So uh, the output. So the question was, what's the output? The output is a URL object. You're you're using a uh, class. You're using a uh, class uh, method. Yes. Here we go. From text. And this is basically like, it's, it should be clear from this that you get a URL object back. And that object uh, is not indexable, like a named tuple that would come from a URL parse. Instead, it's an actual object. It's got methods. It is uh, immutable. It is immutable. Um, however, it is uh, not a tuple, which I think is an improvement. Yeah, but uh, can I like, make something like to dict? Yeah, uh, sure. It has a dict, and you can grab the dict if you want. And uh, it's a normal Python object in that regard. Yeah, like change something and generate new URLs. Yeah, so I can do it. Yeah, you can definitely do it. And I'm happy to demo it for you after, but I think that we're at time. Okay. So let's save more questions for after. Thank you, everyone. You've been great. Thank you so much.